Hi kids, it's me, Space Ghost, inviting you to sit down and enjoy what's about to happen as Matt Harrigan grabs his forceps and pries deep into Space Ghost's brain to find out all sorts of stuff. Fascinating? No. Time-consuming? Yes. So kill an hour or so with us. It beats you sitting around the house spanking it to one of Mom's McCall's magazines. We've been doing this for a long time, George. We have been... We growed up together. How old are you? 60. I'll be 62 in November. Fingers God, crossed. It, does, it doesn't seem possible. <laughs> so, just be sure and send me something nice. What do you want? You know what I like. What? <laughs> just wait for the Sloten auction or the uh, outsider and vernacular art sale at Christie's and you'll... <laughs> What is a uh, make your tribute in the form of anything? I don't have a Eugene von Brunchenhain. What's that? <laughs> he did these great dragons and smeared paint, like like almost like finger painting, but but the work was beautiful when he did it. It was great, and he made chicken bone crowns and thorns, weird stuff. What's his name? Eugene von Brunchenhain. Oh, rolls off the tongue, does it? It huh? does. It just flows. <laughs> <laughs> it flows right out. Woofly, I need. Add off Woofly, but, you know, I don't want the network to have to spend too much. How much does something from him cost? Well, from Woofly? Yeah. Oh, gosh. The little ones now, I think, are 20, anywhere between 20 and 40,000. Do you have any? No, God, don't I wish I had one. What's your nicest art that you have? Well, the, the one that, you know, everybody at the network thought I was nuts on was my Fenster, which at the time nobody was buying at, at that level where, you know, I had a dealer tell me, it's 15000 I said, I can't do that. That's insanity. But Lazo had already, <laughs> Lazo is what you call an enabler. He, he went through his folk art period, and we actually had a few adventures together where, you know, we went at one point and saw uh, R.A. Miller in a driving rainstorm. He wanted to do this. So we did. I thought, well, this is fun. What the hell? Another time we went to Tuscaloosa and looked at self-taught. We went to, to Fenster's once or twice. And I remember him saying to me, he said, you know, you've you've gone into this so deep, you ought to just go ahead and really go nuts and get a big one. I said, well, you know, come to think of it, you're right. And um, I ended up popping 11000 bucks for this thing. Why are you attracted to outsider art? I think it was my own impulse to create you know when you when you you did low country we we tried that and you followed me to the high that time with the camera the high museum in atlanta uh carrie was awesome the the curator carrie prisbola mind you carrie was the contemporary curator and she had me up on the fourth floor that was you know that's where the big boys went and she saw something in them early on. Well, I mean, I never was trained. It was just stuff I made at home for fun. And that's, I think, what drew me to these guys. They were all doing it not because they were trying to retail them. They were doing them because they had to do them. You're an accomplished artist. You have your work. It's hung in the High Museum in Atlanta, among other places. Did you start doing your art in advance of your enthusiasm for art that you'd collect? Yeah, it I have always I've always drawn. Going back as far as I can remember, I've always I've always drawn. So I've always been self-taught. I mean, I our field, our area, I I knew nothing. When I walked in with you guys, all I knew was radio and writing for radio and being silly and coming up with voices and my friends hated me in Atlanta part of the time because I would imitate them. How did you get involved with Cartoon Network? I would go visit my friend Kate, and she said, oh, promos. My God, you should be doing promos. Go talk to Sam and go talk to Ann. And, you know, I started meeting all the promo people. And sure enough, they would throw me a bone. So I was already in the building. And enough of these guys, I guess, started talking to people who were becoming the nexus of, of the cartoon beginning team and Clay, to have rest his soul, Clay told me the story oddly on a panel right before he passed away. Um, he said, you know, you know how it happened? 
And I said, no, I don't remember anything. He said, the audition, they had a curtain up. And enough people, I guess, from TBS and TNT and Turner Home Entertainment had said, have you read George? Have you read George? And everyone there, I think except for Mike, was who the hell is George? Went in and... It was one of those things where, like, I guess if a focus group is not completely soundproofed, you could kind of get whether or not you were doing okay. And I looked at the copy, and I don't know what I blurted out first, but it was I've always told people it had to be something like, what's he supposed to sound like, an idiot or something? And you could hear the other side of the glass going, <laughs> you know, kind of like this little veiled chuckle. And I thought, hey, I'm scoring with, with the curtained window. So I I just kept going, and in the beginning, it was a little more stentorian than I would have liked, but Gary Owens, I grew up adoring as a child. That was my Saturday thing, running in. So this is you auditioning for Space Ghost? This is me auditioning for Space and Ghost. And you know who's behind the curtain? It was, I had no idea who was behind the curtain, okay. and in fact, somebody, I think it was Clay, told me there was like a curtain behind the curtain. So if I Whoa. peeked, all I got was the curtain that was in the control room. So they really had everybody hidden. Why did they have them hidden? I don't know. I guess they just wanted to listen to the voice. They didn't want the distraction. And really, when you think about it, it was a pretty brilliant idea. They just wanted to see if the voice could stand, I think, on its own. Is it something that would support what they were trying to do? And then at some point, we just started talking to people, and, and I credit you for a lot of that. I credit, I think, Dave. Dave Willis always would try and get me upset. <laughs> and there's something to be said for me annoyed because the funny seems to increase exponentially the more pissed off I get at something. So, you know, if the room was hot, with you guys, it almost became like an interrogation at, at Guantanamo because they would keep raising the room temperature and before i know it i've got no air at all i'm sweating my ass off and it's like can i just get a break and maybe have a coffee and use the bathroom however it got green lighted god only knows but you know clay remembered everything clay was a steel trap yeah god bless him he'd remember every nuance and he told me on stage at this show that was uh, not nice to us in orlando um, what, they weren't nice to you? They, they weren't nice to us. He had to drive down. They barely sprang on a room for him. And I remember I got to drive over from Lakeland every single day of the show. The guy was doing us, little four-foot-tall guy, was doing us an immense favor having us. And it turned out to be a great panel, one of the biggest laughs I ever had because we walk in, and the guy who was the MC was this sugared-up crazy guy God bless him. He was really fun, but he was just talking to the audience and warming people up and being funny. And Clay and I looked at each other and said, let's just sit down and be in the audience. <laughs> and we sat there for a good 25 minutes. He didn't know us. And um, it reached a point where this guy's going, hey, well, who in the audience knows how to do some of the voices from Space Ghost? And Clay raised his hand, and he comes over and is like, hey, what voice can you do? And Clay's like, well, I, I can do Zorak. <laughs> and, and the guy sticks the mic in front of him. He's like, um, Space Ghost. And he's like, hey, that's pretty good. I don't know if it's as good as what they would have used. And Clay's looking like me. Who is this twit? And he's like, what voice can you do? And I go, well, I don't know. I do a fairly serviceable space ghost. And at that point, the audience is looking at us and laughing their asses off. And this guy still doesn't know who we are. But that was one, that was one of my all-time favorite experiences. With I'm glad that could happen with him because we're just sitting there like a couple of dopes going, well, let's give this guy a little more rope. <laughs> you know? What was your relationship with Clay? I, I wish it had been, I, I wish I could share that we hung out more. We did barbecue. We would see each other at Dragon Con. And I wish I could tell the story that we were like folk art buddies and hung out and had a lot of wild, crazy adventures together. We were always friendly. And at one point toward the end, 
Sadly, he thought I was mad at him. It was a real I love Lucy moment because he thought I was PO'd at him and I thought he was PO'd at me. We made the peace and I said, there, if there's any doubt between you, same show in Orlando, by the way. I said, if there's ever any doubt whether I love you or not, let the word go forth. Because of you, I ate gas station hummus. My hand to God in heaven above. The man looks at me and goes, um, well, somebody brought him a, a Subway, not a Subway, but they brought him like a big beef sandwich from the same gas station. And, and he's eating this enormous beef sandwich at the table. And he goes, um, you want this? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll eat that. He's like, oh, man. And I checked the thing, and it, it actually had a date on it. And I thought, well, you know, if I die, we sue the gas station. But he ate this enormous honking beef sandwich. One year, I guess before we had we had gotten popular, they had us in the basement. And don't ask me how this happened. Mickey Rooney couldn't have possibly annoyed anyone. But we were at Dragon Con, and— Clay looks up, and he goes, my God, we're sitting across from Mickey Rooney. How'd that happen? And I said, I'll be damned if I know. And she, Oscar winner, here's Mickey Rooney sitting across from us, big Hollywood star. And I didn't see it happen, but Clay told me later nobody had ever made him more uncomfortable in his life because he had a big honking sandwich under the table, and he kept waiting. Well, you know, we weren't famous enough to know where the green room was. We didn't know where the stars went, and they would all disappear and have their lunches. Apparently, he bends over. His hands are clean. He's had a chance to go and wash up, which, you know, sometimes you don't always get to— be fastidious in your habits at the table. You just use the sanitizer and hope the bun doesn't taste like alcohol when you finish the last three bites. But he, he starts to lift up this big meatball hoagie, and he's looking. I'm trying to put this where you have the visual in your head. He looks up, and about the time his mouth is fully open, almost like you're, you're getting ready to back a DC-9 into the hangar. You know, it's it's open and ready to go on this meatball hoagie, and he looks across, and here's Mickey Rooney with his arms folded, giving Clay the skunk eye and shaking his head slowly left to right, as if to say, we don't eat in front of our fans. And poor Clay took the cue, put the damn sandwich back under the table, and I, I don't know, for all I know, it could be sitting there today. I don't know if he ever got to eat. The poor guy. Did you and Clay share sort of an enthusiasm for collecting things? Clay's house, and God bless him, he had just a massive sci-fi collection. But I also remember when, you know, it's like we all have our vice, Lazo kind of kick me in the pants. Not that I would have not done damage had I not met Mike, because I was already into pop art print before we had lithographs by Tom Wesselman and James Rosenquist and some pretty big stuff. And I had tried to do modern before I had a Picasso that was the second thing I ever bought. You had a Picasso? Had a Picasso print from a book called... Uh, and I know the people who speak French are going to laugh their asses off here. I can't get close even, but it was like Don L'Etelier de Picasso in Picasso studio. And the piece was uh, still life with glass and apple. So the first 50 people, even then, it was like before there was ever, you know, big time television scamming. The first 50 callers get this free gift. It's like the first 50 people that bought that book actually got the Picasso print that I ended up with. And late, later on, oddly, it's, you know, I had a friend tell me, if you connect all the dots in life, you'll go crazy. I actually used that piece. It was the second piece I ever bought. Mom had to help me get it. And that's actually, actually how I ended up financing her, her funeral service, which is way painful. But that, it's just weird how you connect these dots. What do you mean? You financed it how i lost mom in july of 18 and you know anyone listening here knows 
you know, what a total mama's boy I was. Uh, and it's no secret. I'm proud of it. We were, we were best friends and, uh, you know, she uh, embraced every facet of any kind of artistic output I had. Go back to your, your Picasso and your mom. That financed, honest to God, the estate what was a mess. And I ended up telling the funeral home, you know, I was in a mess too. Uh, you know, you have these ups and downs in life and I'm just... I'm not sure uh, I understand what you're my saying. My credit was in the toilet at the time. When your mom passed. Yeah. You know, you have moments where you're going, wow, I'm making great money doing this. And then you have the reality years where you're going, you know, wow, don't I wish, uh, you know, somebody had fallen a hole at FX and they'd bring me back. Or or you guys maybe, you know, hey, let's get stupid and do Space Coast 2020. You hope for those those uh, reboots. But this piece that mom helped me get, yeah, it was really weird. I finally, I was desperate and I looked at the funeral director and I said, you know, I've had up years, I've had down years. Uh, I'm not having a good year. Would you take a Picasso as collateral? <laughs> you know, and they're looking at me sitting there like now in a t-shirt, you know, with holes and blue jeans that have seen better days and work boots. And they're like, is this guy out of his mind? Well, I had gone, I had the ugly task of buying, you know, and we're all going to be there someday. And God bless you if you're stronger than I am. I had to go buy the last outfit she would ever wear. It was a horror story. And I went into Dillard's. That was a weird moment in itself because the lady who had always helped her was just standing there. It's like something out of a Stephen King novel, just kind of hovering there, waiting for me to come in. And she knew something was up because she hadn't seen Mom in forever. And, you know, I shared with her what had happened, and she was instantly depressed by it. And she said, well, let's, let's go do this right and we went and found the last outfit. And uh, Claire was a wonderful supporter, and they called and said, is this guy for real? You know, he's wanting to use a Picasso to finance his mother's service. And she said, oh, yeah, he's, he's very, very much real. And <laughs> kind of leaned in and said, and it ain't the only thing in the house. So if you'd rather finance it with the Warhol or you know, the Rosenquist or the, the Dali, you, you know, you call the ball and they're like, no, if you say he's good, he's good with us. And they gave me a year to pay it back. And that's when, uh, I saw you last, uh, last September, right after, not long after the service, sleep deprived, <laughs> barely moving and on to my, I think it was 18 city tour to pay the funeral home. Have you paid it off? Oh, yeah. I did it. I did it in 91 days. Don't ask me how, you know, but I thought, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is use the piece that she helped me get right out of college as my graduation gift. I'm not going to lose that. That was a gift? That was, that was her gift to me for graduating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What was doing American Dad like? American Dad was a blast. Although it's more a blast, I have to confess, I think I got it because of our mutual pal, Seth Green. Seth, I'm sure, got me the gig. Seth, it's more of a lab experiment. Seth will say, I need a judge. What have you got? And I'm like, what about one of those great old kind of, you know, buttoned down, tightly wired guys from Perry Mason? He's like, what's that? You know, do that. It's like, Mr. Mason, if you don't have any objection, we'll hold court in recess until noon tomorrow and we'll revisit this matter. You know, yeah, 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 do that. So it's more of like a lab project with Seth. Seth's more open and with, um, with American Dad, there was supposed to be a sportscaster part. And I kept falling back in because of the voice being the way it is now. I kept falling in between, you know, fourth and 10, and comes the young quarterback from, you know, it was more of the traditional sound. And they said, what other sports thing can you do? And the only other thing I had in the repertoire was like drunk Skip Carey. Let's hear it. I don't think Skip was ever drunk. But it's just this kind of nasally thing like, 
Wow, that was some sort of play there. We'll be back in a moment with more of the Braves live on insert radio station name here. I'm going down or during the break and drink some hot dog brine out of the tub in front of the stadium. They didn't like that either. <laughs> but I thought, man, this is gold. Why Why don't you use that? And then the next thing I know, I look at the credit and it's like sports guy, Maurice LaMarche. I'm like, oh, well, of course, Maurice doesn't have enough money. For God's sake, don't support me. Let's keep bringing in the guys who are already worth $35 million, like my buddy Billy West. $35 million freaking dollars. And Tom Kenny. Tom hung around too late at Dragon Con for me last year. He, he stayed on, on the last day. And I'm thinking, well, you know, now I'll bank plenty of money because the big guys will be gone. <laughs> and for whatever reason, Tom, God bless him. Tom's a pal. I love them both, Billy and Tom. But they're both worth 35 damn million dollars. They've done everything. They've made a fortune. They don't have to worry about the money. I'm sitting here, you know, going, well, the thing I did yesterday in Leesburg was six customers. Will that be enough to get the dog as next guard? So, so <laughs> I saw, and it's the God's truth. Now, I found I made $104 yesterday. Come and get him, girls. <laughs> Attention, wealthy doctor ladies. <laughs> Single man, almost 62, no real source of income. <laughs> art collection and enough real estate to choke an ox. But see, all that's break even, so I'm not really rich. I can't turn anything down. I have, you know, if it's if it's something that's radioactive and it's going to be in your backyard, I've got to be the guy going, get two when you call free. You know, the second one's absolutely free, but call within the next five minutes. I have a friend who does that without any remorse does at that, all. Does that hinder your commercial viability or does it matter i i've never done those i'm proud to say i haven't done any of the infomercials but the fact that i opened the republican debate at the end of 2015 i think that got me in some trouble maybe you know really but, for but, real it got you in trouble i don't know i mean it, it, there might have been a lot more work for me if but they wanted that midwestern sound like i just did seriously they wanted i'm certain they wanted sam Give us something but that, Sam's you, that you like said. Ha- what oh, would you have said for It's it? like um, live, live from the University of Colorado at Boulder, the 2015 Republican presidential debate. Your money, your vote. So looking back all these years of doing this, would you do anything differently? No, because there's been – there have been enough moments – Where, you know, you go, well, where else would something like that happen? This is awesome. You know, how else would you make a friend like that? How else would you have that art experience? Case in point, the year we had Michael Stipe, they had just signed Monster and uh, just shovel loads, dump trucks full of money they dumped. I think it was in 19, what was it, 1995 or six? And in those dollars... They dump all this money, and he didn't care. Showed up to us in a Volvo with no AC. I'll never forget it because I walked him out. Volvo with no AC, and they had just made $80 million. Like you and I would pick up the phone and do something for, you know, 100 and 200 whatever bucks. And walked in, could not have been any more funny, could not have been any nicer to everybody. Uh and they had warned, you know, they gave us all these warnings, oh, don't don't get into politics and don't ask him about his personal life. And I'm like, what do you guys think, I'm mental or something? Which, don't answer that. But, you know, all these things, don't ask for an autograph, be polite. And I'm like, I'm always nice to these people. You know, famous people I've had before did enough in radio, I'm not going to embarrass the network. And at the end of it, it was just one of those weird moments where, come on to the green room, he took we had Tanya Bergen, I remember. And he takes me and Tanya back and he starts showing off his photographs. And I didn't know what an accomplished photographer he was. And I've told the story so much people are sick of hearing it, but he hands Tanya one that he shot of a little girl asleep in somebody's lap at a wedding. Tanya starts sniffling, you know, and I'm like, oh God, here we go. You know, because I'm a pushover too. I cry at nothing. And, you know, but then he turns around and he hands me one of a guy, 
your camera point of view and the guy's like facing this way and the guy's holding to the camera a pack of Lance Toast Chi crackers. Just like that. And he goes, this one's up your alley. Well, I didn't realize, but thankfully, because of my weird art network already ensconced comfortably within my realm, I go in and see my friend Jane Jackson, still the eponymous uh, Atlanta Photography Gallery, Jackson Fine Art. I go in, and I'm like, hey, Jane, uh, and she's like, oh, my God, and I was all set to ask, and she goes, you got Michael Stipe from, and she starts listing the shows that the Toast Cheek Cracker had been in. In, in France and London and all these different places. She said he handed you like a $5,000 photo. Wow. Blew my socks off, signed the back, titled it, dated it, everything I thought that wouldn't happen. So connect the dots a few months later, one of those weird confluences we were talking about. Uh, we had had David Byrne on, and David was awesome. And I remember he and I had this weird talk about death. And he asked me, well, you know, when you go, what do you want? And I said, I, I want like a salad bar in front of the casket with a sneeze guard. And so, you know, it's like encourage people who come to pay their respects to me to eat better, which is what I should have done, you know. And he laughed, had this weird, crazy laugh. But I had been asked to host Howard Finster's 85th birthday at the High Museum. I go in. Sure enough, here's a video from Byrne. And at the reception, the room starts kind of, you know, you can hear people going, oh, that's And coming across the room to say hello is Stipe, who had so much fun with us. And the Peach Buzz guy standing next to me, this, this little clip that used to be in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, whatever celebrity sightings there were, you know, the guys, hey, what's it like to do Howard Finster's birthday? And asked what a you know crazy collector I am and all. Here comes Stipe and introduces his mom and just couldn't have been any damn nicer and said how much fun he had with us. Wow. But it was just so cool. It's one of those lines that's like we had Stipe, we had Byrne. Yeah. I was already in that Finster universe. I didn't realize David Byrne had won album cover of the year from Rolling Stone because of Finster painting him holding the earth on his shoulders. Stipe had already done two covers with Finster. So it's just, you know, if you connect those dots in life, your head will explode trying to connect those meaningful moments. But it was a blast. You have an interest in outsider art. Yeah. You are an artist yourself. Yeah. And you're a voiceover actor on what some people describe as an outsider TV show. What does that say about you? I don't know. I mean, it's either it's it's either it speaks volumes, I guess, in my behalf, or says, well, you know, he. He's just this oddball we pulled in off the street and managed to squeeze a couple of usable items out of. And, you know, uh, I had a friend who used to bring me into surgeries who very much agreed that I had the aptitude, even though not the math skills, <laughs> necessarily to have been a pretty good surgeon. And luckily, it was late 80s, early 90s when he would pull me into these things. And, uh, you know, now you can't, you can't do the stuff that we would get away with, but he had call and say, subtotal gas, subtotal gas threat to me at four o'clock. And I'm like, where? And he would name the hospital OR6. I'm like, okay. And he was teaching me. I got pretty good with MRIs. He was teaching me how to read x-rays, um, pulled me into all these things. And I just kept thinking, my God, we're going to Leavenworth, you know, because, <laughs> You know, how how would that have worked out if I ended up being a self-taught physician? Well, he passed. We've got to let him in. He passed the MCAT. Did your dad have artistic tendencies? None. None? None. We were never close. That's the sad thing, and, and it's not for lack of trying on my part. Do you have brothers and sisters? None. So you were an only child, not only close child. with your dad? Um, you, not, yeah. not for trying, you said? Not for, not for lack of trying, you know, because uh, many times I would try to, you know, uh, build some sort of a connection. And there's just, you know, it's, it's like trying to reach a station where there's no transmitter. How do you account for that? Why, why do you think? <laughs> not a clue. 
Now, probably because of the differences, if I had to guess, you know, uh, he was just one of those guys that, you know, would go out and tinker around with the car and, you know, uh, never much cared about. Uh, my, I know my grandfather was an executive with Gulf Oil, and he said, uh, Ed, why don't you let me get you in the company? You know, let me let me move you up beyond, you know, where you are. Let's Let's get you some sort of a a possibility of an executive career someday. And he was just, he wasn't interested, didn't have any desire for that. Does your dad know about all of your artistic achievements? I'm, I'm sure he had to have heard something by now. I mean, they, I'm, I'm sure somebody must have showed him something on a computer by now. Have you uh, met Gary Owens? I was always really, really upset that I didn't get to do that interview with us. And and Mike tried to make me feel better about it. He said, man, if you were in the same room with Gary, I wouldn't say take a swing at you. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure Gary, who owns the other half of real estate in California that Bob Hope didn't buy, I'm sure Gary would be really upset that I landed space ghost coast to coast. Gary being the original voice. Gary was space the space original, the one I grew up with. I loved it as a child. You know, hold on, Jen, we're going in for so, you know, and all the adventures. It's the dung monster. Dun, 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 dun. You know, I better use the extendo ray or whatever. You know. uh, love that stuff. Have you been recognized by your voice? Oh, yeah. And, and usually at the worst possible time, like if you go in with flu or something, that's when the guy at the pharmacy is going to go, you sure sound familiar. <laughs> you know, I used to do cartoons. <laughs> I just lie sometimes and go, I'm Sam Elliott's houseboy. Try delicious buttered peas. They're good. Jordan, Paid I think, for by the Buttered Pea Council. I think we're done. God, I didn't give you anything good. Music from this episode is a song called Bad Case by Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real from their Fish Center performance, which you can watch on our YouTube page. Check out adultsum.com slash podcast for links to the things George and I were just talking about and email any comments you have to adultsumpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.